So somebody had asked me to make a video comparing the potential or the power of uh, mutants versus inhumans. And I imagine a lot of this is just rooted in the fact that we have X-Men versus inhumans going on right now. The event I don't think is slated to end for a little while. Uh, but uh, for those of you guys who are new to, to Marvel Comics, those of you guys who are not wildly familiar with Marvel, um, the Inhumans and the X-Men are about as different as you can get when it comes to what their role is in the Marvel Universe. Uh, when the Inhumans first showed up in, in Fantastic Four number 45 in 1965, uh, they were just designed to be very small. They were designed to be very niche. They were never, never huge. There were only ever maybe like nine Inhumans at most, and it was the Inhuman royal family. And all the stories really just focused on them. But the way that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby made them, they were designed to be reclusive. Their origin story was rooted in in the Kree. You know, this, this alien race that had been fighting another race called the Skrulls, and the Kree had come to the realization that if they could basically create spies that could infiltrate other civilizations they could conquer those civilizations from within and so what they did is they basically showed up on earth they grabbed a handful of humans they modified their genes and they ensured that when these humans undergo exposure to these gas to this gas called the Terrigen mist that uh, their cells would be altered and they would take on a new physical form now eventually the creed just kind of abandoned the experiment and these inhumans were just sort of left in isolation and left to govern themselves but they created a, a very reclusive uh, uh, location called Attilan, and they just lived there. And so when they first arrived, the Fantastic Four, uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby basically said they had always been there. We're just now seeing them for the first time because they're just now really stepping out into the outside world. But the kicker with the Inhumans is that once they underwent exposure to the Terrigen Mist, there was no coming back. I mean, you couldn't undo the Terrigen Mist. You couldn't take that away. You know, whatever physical form they took, whatever powers they developed, they were going to be that way for the rest of their lives. So for example, in the, uh, in the Inhumans community, in a telling there's a door there's a gateway that you can walk through and it'll take you anywhere you want to go in the world. It's like Lockjaw the dog, except that the door can't go anywhere. But that door was a person at one point, And after they underwent Terra Genesis, they turned into a door that allows people to go anywhere they want to in the world. It's a crazy situation, but that's just some of the extreme abilities that the Inhumans developed. Now, having said that, when the X-Men first showed up in X-Men number one, you know, in 1963, they were, uh, they were really like an experiment because, you know, Marvel was kind of messing around with the idea of saying, hey, let's create a teenage superhero team. And they were successful for a little while. I mean, it worked because, you know, at the time, Marvel had Spider-Man. So Spider-Man was a teenage superhero. Then they had the Fantastic Four. They had the Avengers, which were, you know, superhero teams. And so the action was like a best of both worlds. It was a teenage superhero team and it worked. Now, with their original introduction, it was really just the circumstance where it was it was like, you know, there are these people that exist out there that have X genes and these X genes, you know, will manifest under a multitude of different conditions. But the most notable condition, the most common condition is puberty. You know, just like hormones kick in around the time of puberty, uh, this X gene would activate and these kids would develop mutant powers. More often than not, they wouldn't know how to control them because their families wouldn't even know that they were mutants. And so you would have, you know, Charles Xavier, you would have Cyclops or somebody show up. They would appear to them, tell them that they're mutants, that their powers, you know, are a gift, and they would whisk them off to the Xavier Institute, where they would just become part of the X-Men team, learning how to use their abilities. The problem with this was that in Brave and the Bold number 54, 1964, DC turned right back around and created the Teen Titans. The Teen Titans were basically children, they were, they were just composed of sidekicks, you know, from the most notable DC superheroes at the time. Not only that, you had drama, you had romance, you had teen angstiness, I mean, you had, you know, all these, these really real world world teenage elements thrown into the story. The reason why that blew the X-Men out of the water was because of the fact that teenagers liked reading stories that were basically about them, where they could see themselves in, in the stories themselves. Uh, with Stanley and Jack Kirby, they always created their stories where, unless it was like Doctor Strange, or unless it was, you know, Iron Man or something like that, unless it served some kind of political purpose or drawing in some particular group from, you know, beyond the United States, uh, they were usually rooted in an idyllic scenario. What would it be like if teenagers had powers, you know, and it would be very out there, and it'd be very fun, and it'd be very enjoyable. But, you know, we were kind of encroaching on this age where it was the rebel without a cause, and teenagers wanted to be rebels. They wanted to see themselves as rebels, and the Teen Titans let them do that. But uh, by the time Chris Claremont took over the X-Men series, up until that point, the Inhumans and the and, and mutants were kind of neck and neck in terms of abilities because they were never fully fleshed out. I mean, the, the writing of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, the writing of Roy Thomas, you know, the few other people who came across before the X-Men uh, line was canceled, they had just focused on beasts with agility, you know, Cyclops with Optic Blast, Jean Grey had, you know, uh, telekinesis, Iceman had ice powers, and, you know, 
Warren Worthington had wings. You know, you had the villain uh, Magneto, you had, you know, a handful of mutants here and there who were introduced with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, Scarlet Witch, Brick Silver, so on. But the powers were very contained, they were very minimal because there weren't that many mutants out there. Just like with the Inhumans, there weren't that many Inhumans out there, so the powers were very minimal. But when Chris Claremont took over the series, he didn't view the X-Men as a superhero team only, he saw the X-Men as potential to basically create a soap opera. He was like, let's focus on their individual lives. Let's create new X-Men. Let's introduce new heroes. Let's create love triangles. Let's have arguments. Let's have debates. Let's have a circumstance or several circumstances where not everyone agrees with Charles Xavier's view of a peaceful coexistence between humans and mutants. Let's, let's radically change Magneto. And so because of this, we saw introductions of characters like Nightcrawler, Colossus, Wolverine. I mean, we saw all these different powers being introduced now. You know, we had people with instantaneous healing factors, people who could teleport, people who had organic metal skin, you know, and because of this huge explosion under Chris Claremont for the next 17 years, he just kept adding more and more mutants to it. But he couldn't have, you know, the same mutants all with the same power. They all had to have unique powers. And so sometimes there were modifications. Charles Xavier was the telepath up until Emma Frost showed up. And then Emma Frost was the telepath because she was more powerful than Charles Xavier. You know, we had guys like, uh, like Sebastian Shaw. We had, you know, people like Bishop, you know, both of them, both of those guys could absorb energy and then use it in different ways. Sebastian Shaw turned it into physical strength. Bishop just channeled it back at people. We had Storm who could control the elements. You know, it was really, really cool storytelling, but the more mutants that were added, the more, more powers were bolstered. And in fact, there were some characters who were wildly powerful, you know, as their characters grew and as they progressed. For example, Franklin Richards was originally never a mutant. Franklin Richards was a kid whose birth was engineered by way of the cosmic control rod. Susan Storm was struggling with birth. Reed Richards, Johnny Storm, the thing, all thought she was going to die. So they went to the negative zone. They grabbed the cosmic control rod of Annihilus, which is basically the negative zone's equivalent of the power cosmic. Uh, they came back to Earth. They helped Susan Storm give birth to Franklin Richards. And then he was basically imbued with a fraction of the cosmic control rod's power, which is why he was able to, you know, turn himself into an adult, you know, calling himself Avatar, different things like that. But as time progressed, they basically rolled his character over to be, or I guess it was revealed to be a mutant. This was established in the Onslaught saga. That was one of the biggest reasons why Onslaught was so huge. It's because Franklin Richards was no longer just some kid that could do crazy things without any real explanation. It was, well, he's a mutant with reality warping powers. Because of this, mutants just grew to be more and more powerful just because of the fact that with so many mutants being added all the time, there had to be a way to basically keep them more interesting, and so the powers became more and more extreme. But on the other side of the coin, the Inhumans were still small. It was still only maybe nine or ten Inhumans. They were just backup features in Fantastic Four and Thor. They had a few volumes here and there, like, you know, Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee's Volume 2, which is probably the best run ever. But again, it was just a handful of Inhumans. And, you know, again, you couldn't change the powers of Black Bolt. You couldn't get rid of his quasi sonic scream. That was a result of Terra Genesis, and you can't undo Terra Genesis. You know, you couldn't change the powers of Medusa. You couldn't change the powers of Gorgon. I guess you could have added powers to Karnak, but it was really cool to have a guy who had no powers, but could, you know, who could somehow sense the structural weakness in everything that he saw. It was really, really cool the way their characters were designed, but they were always just niche. Now, all this changed over the course of about 10 or 15 years. When Joe Quesada came onto the scene, Joe Quesada said, hey, look, our, our comics are struggling. We got to trim the fat. We got to get rid of all these mutants. I mean, half of them we aren't even using and the other half aren't even being used right. So let's just get rid of them. You know, let's reduce them in number. And so we got the House of M, the Scarlet Witch warped reality. So everybody had everything they wanted. She set reality back to normal after everybody confronted her about it. And in the last, you know, second, she said no more mutants. And 98% of the mutants population just became a giant ring, you know, around the, the planet Earth, their powers were basically gone. And so, you know, 98% of mutants were now just regular people. And it really just kind of allowed Marvel to start from scratch. They reduced it down to 198. There were several stories that went on for a while. We got Decimation. We even got a line of stories called the 198. But the idea was to essentially reduce them in number. But even then, 198 mutants were still a lot of mutants and a lot of powers that were already established. But with the Inhumans, it was still just a small number. It was just a small number of, of Inhumans. Now, again, this really changed with Marvel Now. 
The rumor mills churned out a lot of things over the course of the last, you know, three or four years or so. Uh, but Marvel Now was like a, a two or three stage rollout. It was a progressive rollout that took place over the course of, you know, some amount of time. And it was kind of like Marvel's answer to DC's New 52. But instead of a hard reboot, Marvel just kind of shifted things up a bit and they just more or less switched creative teams. They changed the position of some characters. So Carol Danvers was no longer Miss Marvel. She was now Captain Marvel. Um, there were a lot of, you know, a few changes that were made here and there, but one of the major changes that was made came out of an event called Infinity. Now, this was actually a two, a two, a two-face event, so to speak, in the sense that on one half, you had the Avengers off Earth fighting things, and Hickman was basically retelling the origin of the universe, and then on the other hand, you had Thanos invading the planet Earth looking for his offspring. During the invasion of Earth, he fought Black Bolt of the Inhumans, Black Bolt detonated the Terrigen Bomb, and the Terrigen Mist started spreading throughout the world. That's why the Terrigen Mist are spreading through the world right now, and all new, all different Marvel. It's just a continuation of the, uh, the Infinity storyline going into Inhuman and Inhumanity and all that kind of good stuff. But what this did is it allowed different writers, most notably Charles Soule, to come back and start expanding the Inhumans roster more so than it had ever seen before. Instead of just the Inhuman royal family and Attilan, we now found out that with this Terrigen bomb blowing up and all these different Inhumans coming into existence, it was like the space race. There was a mad dash to grab as many of these new Inhumans as possible. And we learned that there were thousands of groups of Inhumans that existed around the world that no one ever knew about. And with this massive bolstering of Inhuman population, suddenly there were a new plethora of Inhuman powers that were cropping up that we hadn't seen before. Now there were Inhumans that could absorb energy. There were Inhumans that could discharge energy. There were Inhumans that could read minds. It was all crazy in terms of what their abilities were, but, in terms of power by power comparison, the mutants come out on top here just because of the fact that their stories have been written much longer. There's a lot of mutants out there who still exist and are still wildly powerful because when you think about it, you've got mutants that can warp reality on a cosmic scale. You've got mutants that can control the minds of every being on the planet. You have mutants whose powers extend out into the universe itself. You've got all different kinds of mutants out there, but within humans, you don't have uh, in humans that can warp reality on a cosmic scale. You don't have in humans that can control the minds of the world's populations and humans powers are far more contained and humans powers only have just large enough of a sphere of influence that they can impact the people in their immediate vicinity but they can't really impact the whole world but again this is hopefully this answers the question that you guys have but if you're new here to comics explained uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and uh yeah i will catch you all later peace